Crowd thinned out a little bit. Uh, you've been pretty overwhelmed, I guess. I'm, uh, this is not a topic that I talk about under this title very often. And it's not something that university people generally are called upon to evaluate. And so I'm going to talk about it today because we're always interested in management and, and what management things make a difference in, in uh, net return and so on. So you're going to hear from me a lot this afternoon about does this pay and net return and is, you know, is there something there for variable rate technology to look at, to exploit, to give you higher incomes. Honestly, we're not capable and we're not really asked to evaluate somebody's program that tells you how much nitrogen and population to put out. I'm going to suggest that some of you might be able to do that, but those, those programs are appearing you know, pretty commonly there are several uh, commercial varieties of those out today, and I think what I'm interested in is what corners are, leave, are of management are they able to overcome, what problems are they able to overcome that's going to give you the return on investment that you need to have to make something successful for you. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, Commercial products are, have not been evaluated by people in a way at least that you can see. So you're offered a program that says, you know, this thing will come and it will tell you how much soil nitrogen you have and at a certain time you can uh, go on that basis, so the model will tell us, or you can go take a sample of nitrogen, soil nitrogen and it will tell you how much you need to put on. And these things have a lot of appeal. The first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, plant population, and then we'll talk a little about nitrogen. Most of these things rely on sort of high-tech uh, imaging or other sensing. Uh, you know, imaging is drones and stuff are really cool today, and everybody, uh, I think the imaginations of the marketers run pretty wild and say, look, these guys are all highly excited about paying us $10 an acre to do this, because we got better images than somebody else has. Few of these things have been tested against standard management, and one of my concerns with a lot of this is they don't really, you know, they might say, well, we're, we were able to lower the nitrogen rate that farmers were using. Well, a lot of farmers could turn their rate down 15, 20 pounds, and they'd never see much difference. We already know that or they're just sort of setting up this thing that they can then knock down and say, well, look, you know, these guys are just blindly putting, uh, you know, population the same everywhere, and we know they need different populations in different places, and we can tell them how to do that. And just in some ways, it's not, you know, it's selling you all that do the management a little bit short, I think, uh, and that's one of the problems I've got with it. You know, they set up the standard against which they kind of measure themselves. Or they don't really measure against anything and simply say, well, we have such a big computer that it's got to be good stuff. We have not done much testing, like I already told you, at the university directly. But we can indirectly look at the promise. And that's what we want to do this afternoon, the matching inputs up to the need for inputs in different parts of a field, and we're going to show you how we went about doing that. Have we answered all the questions? Absolutely not. Um, and I'm still trying to turn over, you know, we've been hearing about this uh, for 10 years at least, that if you guys just learned how to do nitrogen better, you wouldn't be having to, you know, just set the thing and do the same rate over the whole field. How backwards can you get? And so our question is, well, what does the cost of that? The real question is how much profit there is to squeeze out of inputs by varying inputs within fields. And secondly, can we learn what best rates are for different zones in a field? You know, those are related, but they're both big questions and difficult to answer. And I'm going to spend more time on the first one than on the second one. 
So variable rate seeding is the first one up. How many planters are already equipped? Well, many planters are already equipped to vary seed drop rates. We know that. I don't know what the number is today, but more than half, I think, of operating planters. So then people say, well, how do we do this? We have the capability, how do we do it? We conducted hybrid by population trials in five to seven sites per year from 2012 through 2016 in small plots and plant stands were close to, to dropped populations. I'm setting up here what we did. Then we just fitted a line to the data and calculated the optimum plant populations based on corn and I'm using 375 a bushel and $3 per thousand seeds. Everything is economic. And we can't talk about maximizing the yields in every part of every field if we really want to try to be economically efficient. And I'll just show you a series of these by year. And these are locations. You don't need to know where they are, but they're mostly in central and northern Illinois. By the way, I've got data from Peter Thomason that I'm going to share with you from Ohio. I did it uh, just, just for you. So you kind of look at these, and these were run from 18,000 to 50,000, and 50,000 is higher than most people expect, but we want to make sure we know what happens when you get populations too high for the conditions. Somewhat surprisingly, this was 2012 was a pretty dry year for us. Yields in these sites were still pretty good, but certainly less than the ones I'll show you in years after that. And you can see in a couple cases they reached a maximum yields did and then they came down, but it actually was fairly rare. This is what today's hybrids do. You know, the answer to this question we're asking here is a lot different today than it would have been even 10 years ago. Hybrids are so much bred for stress that they are able to produce, even at a yield level as you see here, of 130 bushels per acre, it produced the same yield at 50,000 as it did at 26,000. You did not see anything like that happen in 1975. Not even close. These things would have gone barren and fallen apart and you basically would probably have had no yield at 50,000 at all. So this is, what, this is how the world has differed. What does that say for variable rate technology for seeding rate? it says that the potential has been limited by the genetic improvement. By that I mean there's no longer much danger to be higher than you need. And at one time there would have been. This is 2013, same sites, similar responses, but when we have it like this, not very much uh, indication that anything, oh, I never pointed that out, but in one site, this one, you can see it came down. Well, that's the way that's supposed to work. I thought it was a point. This one, you can see it came down at the high population, and that actually kind of dragged the whole curve down. This is 2013. Now the thing is just annoying. There. There. I think I turned it off. But you can see here that none of those came down. So at 50,000 was... You know, it's still, the other thing to notice here is they still peaked at around in the mid-30s. So not only was 50,000 not a problem, but 35,000 was generally plenty, or 34,000. This is 2014, one of our, again, very good years, 2015 and 2016. So there, I've set you up now, we've shown you 32 site years, and let's talk about what we do, what we're doing with these data. So this is a, a, an example of one type of response, and you only saw one of them there that went up, reached a maximum, and then came down. It's pretty rare, but we occasionally get it, and we want to take advantage or know how, what to do with it. So we fit a curve to the data, and in this case it fits really well, and I'll show you the circle here is where the maximum yield was, and the optimum is where the extra yield from adding seed just paid for the seed. So at this rate that we're using, you know, three dollars per thousand seeds, uh, and three seventy-five a bushel, one bushel of extra yield buys uh, twenty-five 
1,200 seeds or something like that. And that's the way you need to look at it. The problem with looking at it that way is that people think, well, I can always get a bushel, so why not just add, you know, 45,000 or something like that? It doesn't quite work that way, but that's what the optimum in these cases is. This is a much more common response to plant population. As I was just showed you through that series of those, about 80% of the time they look like this, where they just go up. We can still calculate, here's the maximum yield, and here's the optimum yield. In terms of bushels, those are usually only about a bushel apart, which should make sense to you. But these level off, and then we just fit a curve that says go up to this point, level off, and then go on out to however high it is. And so I'll show you those five years now with the locations averaged together and show you what these responses look like over each year of those five. And you can see here that, oops, even though years were, you know, yield levels were a little bit dissimilar, the optimum yields of populations each year were almost the same where the triangles are. So you're already starting to figure, well, maybe you just sort of put populations there and you can't gain much by moving them around. And you'd probably be almost right. <laughs> what we did in order to put these data together is similar to what we did for the nitrogen calculator. We put the numbers, we, we, we did this as return to seed. What I mean by that is it's just the yield at any point along here times the price of corn minus the seeding rate times the price of seed. So it's the net marginal return to seed. In other words, when we hit the highest point of this curve, that's where our maximum return to seed is. That's what we would call the economic optimum, uh, as I used before. So that's what it looked like when one set of data looked like that top one where it goes up and then levels off. So the, the return to seed is coming down from the high point here, but it's coming down as a straight line. Basically, we're spending money for seed and we're not getting anything back for it. So we're losing net income in that case. This one goes up, reaches a maximum, and then it comes down as a curve, and that's the difference between them. So this is all 32 of those site years that I showed you by year and uh, averaged over years. This is what the 32 site years of data looked like in terms of return to seed. So I'm setting you up here to, to tell you what, you know, what we try to conclude from a study that didn't start out to be a, a test of variable rate seeding, but we're trying to sort of turn it into one. And if you just average those 32 curves, this is the curve you come out with, and it tells us that the maximum return based on those 32 separate trials we did occurs at 33,461 plants per acre and that that return is $740.09. So that yield level would be, I, I didn't check it exactly, 220 or something like that. Okay, so we know that. So if you said, well, in fields like this in 2017, what kind of seeding rate should I use? And I would say, you know, if you're in that 34, 32 to 35,000 range, you're in good shape. It's also fairly flat up on top, as you can see. I put a little bracket up there to show that if you're 1,500 above or below that, you're not really putting anything at danger. And so that's what we look like. And some of you might say, well, it doesn't look like it comes down very fast. But if you get up to 40,000, which a lot of people have tried doing, you haven't helped yourself. And that's based on if you accept that, you know, you should be about where your previous trials have showed you you should be. Now suppose we had a field with 32 blocks and we knew somehow that the plant population response in each block would be the same as at one of the 32 site years in our study. So this is a pretend thing. So we can calculate the return to seed at the perfect population for each zone or each acre and compare that average over zones to the overall maximum return to seed number. In other words, that, that 34,000 number that I gave you, 
if you, you can calculate what the yield and return to seed would be for each one of those trials, and that would be your uniform seeding rate that you would use, and you're comparing it now to putting different populations in each block. This is what the, the maximum points on the curves look like. Uh, the yellow circle is where the yield was at it, the, the return was at its maximum. So you can see there's a pretty good range there. From down here, we had one site that only needed 25,000 or so, and we had uh, most of them were sprinkled here in the 30s. A couple of them were a little above 40,000. That's kind of how it spilled out. So, you know, you can say, well, are those really that different? And they're all in a pretty small range up there. And what we like to do, just to think about this, is to say, did high yields need high uh, populations? And this is what you can get from that, where you say this is the optimum population and this was the return to seed, or you could call it yield. It's just got the cost of the seed taken out of it. So this is the return to seed at that optimum population, and each dot here is one trial. You see what I'm doing here? So we're trying to figure out how much varying the population based on this actual yield data makes in terms of a return to seed compared to using the same population on all the field. And it's not, you know, we, it looks like the numbers, you know, this is not a real high correlation. There's a lot of floppiness in it. This point kind of sits out by itself and kind of drags down the curve. If you took it away, there wouldn't be very much there, but there's a little correlation and based on this number here, it says that each thousand more plant, each 16, you know, a thousand more plants will give you 16 more um, dollars return over to seed. That's what the 16 refers to. But we know there's a lot of slop in it. So the results of this, when we ran this, is the 32 different optimum populations the average of those was 33,399 plants. We need a 62 fewer plants compared to that, that 32,000 or 34,000 that I showed you earlier, 34,461. Needed for the overall maximum return to seed. The average maximum return to seed, again, from using these variable rate seeding, I'm calling it now, or different populations in each block, Worth was uh, seven forty two eighty nine. That's two dollars and eighty cents more than our return would have been using the same population on all of it. You say, well, that's not very much. Well, here's where it comes from. The nineteen cents of it was from the sixty two plants that we were able to save lower seeding rate, and two dollars and sixty one cents was from the higher yield. We had seven tenths bushel higher yield on average if we use that the seeding rate pegged exactly for each block out there. You say, well, that doesn't really tend to look very right. How did that happen? And the reason it happens, if you go back to this, you see that the, the 34,000, you know, is just in here somewhere about in the middle. Some of these would have had a higher yield and a better return to seed if you had moved them up to that. Others would have had a lower one, so on average, they changed by only seven-tenths of a bushel. Now, this is the data that uh, you're seeing. You're the first group to see it. Um, Peter, I asked Peter if he had some data on plant population response, and he sent me a great big spreadsheet uh, that I had to do a lot of work on. And we had we ended up with 84 trials that he's done over the same time period we did them in Illinois. And these were quite different. The responses are pretty different in that almost all of them, something like uh, 75 of these, responded in that quadratic sense. In other words, they didn't reach a plateau and then sort of level off. They went like this, the yield responses. And I think that's partly because the soils are different. Um, some of these are tilled, some are no-tilled, some are residue studies, some are multiple hybrid studies. And I just took them and crunched them all and had one function from each one. 
And so this is equivalent to what I showed you from Illinois. What do you notice about it that's different? First of all, a lot of these are clustered down here at 25,000, which was the lowest population that was used in those trials. So we had quite a few over these last five years, or you had quite a few, uh, Peter, that you know didn't really need more than the lowest population. In fact, lost yield if your populations uh, were increased above that. That's, a, that's a, a response we did not see or almost never saw in our Illinois data. And it's just a difference in soils and difference in year. But you can see here that, you know, the, but you can see a, a big collection of points, uh, all of these curves, and you can see a few of them are out here in the 40,000s and above, uh, about eight or nine of them. We didn't really have any that were high, that high in Illinois. And you can see, again, they're clustered in the 30s. Well, you have more on the low end and more on the high end than we saw. So you'd say this looks like a more promising thing if you somehow knew in different parts of a field what, what of these responses you're going to get. You could better tune your population to what the actual need is. So that's, that's what we did. And I'm showing you the same thing I showed for the Illinois data, and that is just the, just the circles from that previous slide, now with a line kind of drawn through them. And it does say here again that, yes, higher yields, we've got it called return here, but yield correlation would actually be a little bit better because with, when we take the seed cost off, that increases as we go to the right. So we're kind of pushing that curve down a little. But higher yields required generally higher populations. And that's, you know, I was sort of disappointed when I didn't see really that much of that in the Illinois data. It's much better here, but there's still a lot of slop as you can see. You know, we had some that had, here's one that, you know, was a very low yielding and still needed 43,000 plants uh, per acre to get to its best population. And you can see some out here that were very high yielding and didn't need very many at all. So these are the ones, you know, you look at this and you say, well, in concept, what makes sense is what we've always thought, and that is if you've got a higher yield potential, you probably need more plants to get there. And I think that we see that here, but it's not, you know, lined up perfectly so that every time you had high yields, you needed high populations to get there. You can see here that this, is, this number is 12. That means that the line for every 1,000 it goes over, it goes up $12. So this comes into play when we talk about how would you apply this in a field. And this figure gives you everything you need to apply this in your field. If we turn it into yield, uh, and you'd say, well, you know, this part of the field I expect, you know, uh, 200 bushel yield. The average yield, by the way, in this trial was about 205 in the, at the best population, was around 205 across these 84 sites. <clears throat> and this, is, this shows you that. Um, this uh, is the overall curve than just the average of those previous curves that I showed you, the 84 different curves put together, crunched together into one. And the, the high point of that curve occurred at 32,860, and that was at $672.22 an acre return to seed. That's lower than in the Illinois data. The, populate, the density of the population is only, it's less than 1,000 plants lower. So we are do that same exercise I talked to you about, and the average of those 34 different best or optimum plant populations was 31,630. That's about 1,228 plants fewer than the best the population calculated using all of the data put together. You remember that was less than 100 in the Illinois data. So this is a little more encouraging here than the, than the plants we needed for the overall uh, return that was 32,860. The average uh, from using those separate. This thing has a real mind of its own, and I'm not real fond of it. Um, 
the average return, maximum return to seed from using this variable rate seeding, in other words, 84 different pop populations in this field, was uh, 683.80. That's $11. You remember I said it was 280 in the Illinois data. It's 11 dollars and four cents here. Well, that's a little bit more encouraging in terms of saying, well, now we might have some money here to actually pay to get this OK, it's not going to stop. Um, and that, that 11.04 was three dollars and68 cents from the lower seating cost and $7.36 from the higher yield. So we averaged about two bushel higher yield if you could fix the population in each part where it needed it. It's still a pretty modest return, but it's greater. And when you looked at the data, you could see that it had more potential, that it changed a lot more from one place to another than we saw under our conditions in Illinois. So let's just sum this up. Uh, optimum populations over range of growing conditions mostly range from 30,000 to 40,000 per acre in Illinois, 25,000 to 45,000, I should have said, it per acre in Ohio. The economically optimum seeding rates across sites were fairly similar, 33.4 in Illinois and 32,860 uh, in Ohio. So over sites, optimum population was positively, but sort of weakly correlated with yields. And the simulation that we ran produced a higher net return to seed than uniform seeding, the variable rate seeding, the way we looked at it here. And it, it can hardly not do that, <laughs> because if you somehow say we know what the best population here is, you're always going to be at least a little better off. The point was under, you know, sort of uniformly high yielding conditions, it's going to be a pretty small difference. No, I'm not even holding it up there and it's still there. So we'll try to figure this out. Uh, much smaller in Illinois than it was in, uh, in Ohio. Should we do it or not? Well, I think the answer is yes. Can I throw it against the wall or something? Uh, it, uh, it decided to be a modem at some point in its life. I did get it to go off one time, but it came back on. The penalties for over and under seeding are not large. Um, and that's, a good, that's the good news. The relatively flat yield response to changing population suggests that this return is going to be somewhat limited to variable rate seeding. And I think I've already said that. Here's the kicker. Predicting the optim actual optimum seeding rates for different parts of the field is not going to suddenly get easy. We've seen that, uh, that we tend to use, and so my, with limited returns, I just tell people, don't spend very much to do this. And people say, well, yeah, I can do my own, you know. I just, and I think that's the best approach. Um, you can get somebody to help you, but you know if you're only going to look at four or five dollars, maybe on average, to this, and that's knowing that you're going to get, <coughs> you know, that's going to help you when the when the conditions are good or predictable. But just to use higher seeding rates where you expect higher yields, a thousand seeds for a di every difference of maybe four to five bushels per acre that you expect in a field. But, and this is a big but here, don't drop seeding rates much in the lower yielding parts of the field unless you know why they're lower yielding. If you just see a yield map and say, well, I'll use that and make, and you don't know why the yields were low in parts of the field, that's a mistake. We have a lot of fields in, uh, in 2015 particularly where the low parts were drowned out. If that's why it was low, you don't want to lower the seeding rate in that part of the field. If you have fields that have, you know, uh, a sand lens or something like that in them or a place where you've never seen the yield monitor go above 80, that's a good place to put fewer plants. But there's always a little bit of a problem with this, and that is that, you know, trying to play it safe in parts of the field where you don't expect high yields and then you get weather for really high yields you could actually cost yourself some, some income. 
And that's the experience we've had in Illinois you know, in the last three years. Uh, certainly in 14 and 15, people routinely in the flatter, the soils that are flatter and blacker, you know, they took higher yields off of the part that sloped a little bit in fields than they did over the flat parts. And that was because of drainage. And that was in tile drained fields. And I, I, it was almost universal. I said, well, that's a lesson, you know, if normally on those slopes you'd put less population because you expect lower yields, you probably would have hurt yourself in a case like that. I think there's been too much enthusiasm for trying to drop rates to show that variable rate seeding works. <laughs> and believe me, folks, this isn't the right path to take. Now, by the same token, we don't see any reason to be raising populations up to 40,000 in some parts of the field either because we so seldom get a response up to that level. So just be reasonable about it, I guess, sums it up as well as anything. I'll just mention something about the hybrid question with variable rate. Should we treat hybrids differently? Uh, Maybe, but you know, this is, I'm just showing you a set of hybrids we had there in 13 and 14 and 15 and 16. And my bottom line on this is that hybrids are way more alike than they're different, these top yielding hybrids that we had in these trials. And I think our, even though seed companies, I think I have a slide in here, the set of high yielding hybrids we've used is more, are more alike than they are different in their response to population. One or two hybrids may show sort of opposing trends sometimes, but that's not consistent over years or over sites. You can't count on it. And so companies may give population guidelines. I sense there's a little less of that maybe than there was at one time for individual hybrids. Although, you know, we always uh, saying this hybrid should be at, you know, stay on the low end of your population was always a signal that the thing probably doesn't stand very well. And today we don't really have that signal. Nobody wants to send that signal out. And there may be some sort of defensive hybrids that they say, look, we reserve these for, you know, fields that have never produced more than 120 bushel, and this is where these ought to be, and that may be the case. But for the better hybrids that most people are choosing from among, I suspect that the differences in population response you know, are probably not very great. And I don't know if we nearly need to be concerned. If people say today that the populations need to be kept low on a hybrid, it generally signals to people it's probably not the best hybrid in the world. Having populations in the 30,000s is no real threat to any good hybrid today, and it could be almost anywhere in the 30s. <laughs> uh, although weather conditions can always be a problem, of course. Well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I thought when Roger was doing this, having this problem, he was just incompetent, but uh, <laughs> I can hardly keep that, keep that one up anymore. Well, that says end the show. I guess I don't want to do that. I'm not taking a vote on it. I'm not going to use that anymore. Uh, so we're, we're good with that. Um, Variable rate, variable hybrid planting is one of the newer things that's come out. And I, I got thinking about this and, you know, in some, we, we, fa we had some of this back, I think the first interest in split planter trials and so on was probably 15 to 20 years ago. And companies did some of that and then they kind of quit talking about it. And we haven't heard very much about it until Lo and behold, a planter comes out, planters come, start coming out that have variable hybrid, you know, split seed tanks, and you can put two hybrids in and plant them in the best part of the field. I've never quite figured out if seed companies really wanted that. My suspicion is some of them really didn't. And uh, 
All I was able to do, I went into a couple of our data sets. This is just from our hybrid trials, and we had two hybrids from DeKalb in the 6360 and the 6277 close in maturity. And I just put up here for our different sites in Illinois, I put in what the advantage to 6360. 6360 on average yielded nine bushel higher. And I thought, well, I'll just look at our sort of a random set of locations there to see how the hybrids compare to each other and see if we see, for example, under low yielding conditions, one of these is always better and under high, one of the other one's better. And that's what we came up with. And so when you actually looked at those like I did here, and this is the trial average yield, and this is the advantage, if you take that one freakish point out up there where one hybrid was 20, 46 bushel better than the other, you know, the thing doesn't amount to very much. So I had another set of uh, hybrids we had used in that one population trial I showed you, and this is their, their uh, yields at 34,000, um, I believe it is. I think this one probably was at 40,000. So I just gave them to you here, and I'm not pausing on this very long, but you can see here that these are the four hybrids, two decalb, two pioneer hybrids, and is one of these bars routinely higher than the others, or do they flop around? And the answer is they flop around quite a bit. There's a couple places there you can see where the Pioneer 08987 was, seemed to be higher than anything else. So I decided to look at them this way. This is the old kind of stability analysis where you say, well, this is the trial average yield, and then uh, over those uh, sites where we did these, there were 11 sites, I believe, uh, total. And a lot of them were in that 230 to 250 range. And some of them were really high. Just to see if, you know, in high yielding conditions, again, to see how these, if they did better, some of them did better in high yield conditions than at low yielding conditions. And this one up here that does have those high circles is the one I pointed out to, that blue bar from before. And this is what we would sort of consider a, quote, racehorse hybrid. You know, it does really well under high yielding conditions, but it's no dog down at the lower yielding conditions. And the ones where the, the thing slopes down would be considered more of the workhorse hybrids in that old uh, uh, terminology we use. But their they're, they're spread in the points is pretty great, and I don't know if I can include very much from this or not. Um, Honestly, I think, I think I summed this up in some words here, but breeding for stress tolerance has meant good performance under a wide range of conditions. That's what our hybrids are today. Two top hybrids that you choose to put in variable rate seeding may not perform much differently in parts of a moderately variable field, and you may see, you're always going to see a little difference from one side to the other, but uh, it may not have any pattern to it. Factors like disease tolerance could cause differences if you had a disease in part of the field. But the amount and how site-specific the pressure in such cases is, is is pretty unpredictable. And uh, I guess the other point is there, one of a pair of hybrids chosen for variable hybrid planting is going to be higher yielding over the whole field in any given year than, than the other one. In other words, you know, does a company have to specify one of their hybrids in a variable hybrid planting as the really good one and the other is not quite as good and who wants to call their hybrid not quite as good and so I don't know where we're going to go with all of this uh, which of two hybrids you know wins is kind of uh, is not very predictable the reason that the idea for this is that you have problem areas in the field and you know you can have a hybrid that will address those problem areas that's difficult because problem areas, as I already talked about, good weather makes everything yield well, are not very easily identified or what the problem's going to be. If you have a wet year, it's not the same as if you have a dry year. So variable hybrid planting works better in fields with known and relatively consistent problem areas. But my point there is the loss of overall yield to defense when the defense isn't really necessary, is going to remain a possibility and it represents a cost. So I'm not against the concept of this 
working it out in practice is not, I think, going to be any easier today than it was 15 years ago. In fact, with all hybrids being improved uh, that are sold today, it may be more difficult to make this look profitable than it did 15 years ago. You know, it's never been a real neat and clean thing, even though it's sold and say, well, boy, that makes sense. But, you know, which hybrid you're going to put where? And this is not like split planter where you had to put sort of equal areas. Now you can change, and I think some of them even let you change by unit and put these in. It's just saying that we know more about what's going to happen and how hybrids will react than we actually ever do know. So enough on that. Let's talk about nitrogen a little bit. This is the focus of a lot of activity. This is sort of the... This is the big one in terms of variable rate. And it's because nitrogen is expensive. Uh, it was more expensive than it is today. And we're in, uh, sensitive to putting too much on, or at least in, in, in the theory we are, and having it leave the field. So the first attempts at doing this, and the economists started doing some of this, and you know how they are. But... Uh, Higher yields, you know, we, we, it's a yield goal based system. You put more nitrogen, we expect higher yields. Let's just go to a field and put more nitrogen, we expect higher yields. It, the problem is, of course, yield goal system, I put the bottom point there, it, it doesn't predict nitrogen requirements very well. I'm not going to go into that today, but varying rates based on the yield goals doesn't work very well either. Saving nitrogen without yield loss by applying lower rates where the need is less. That's one of the ideas, although I have said that I didn't think too many people went in to variable rate nitrogen with the idea they'd lower their overall rates. And I think that, that would apply to almost everybody that's involved in it, or both of the questions. So the first two points I raised there is you have, this is the way you have to pay for this. You either get higher yields in parts of the fields where you needed more by putting more on, or you lower the nitrogen rate enough, or you do both. And if you don't do enough of that to pay for the technology, then you haven't gained anything. And people kind of forget that. They say, well, this is the best idea ever, you know, we'll vary rates. And don't think about that. This is very much complicated by several things. Variability in the end response in the same place over years and difficulty in predicting both the yield and the soil supply of nitrogen, hence how much nitrogen fertilizer you need. Let me give you an example. We ran a 10-year study at four sites that I'll talk about, and I'm showing you this is Monmouth corn following corn. This was our nitrogen responses over the 10 years of the trial. These, these nitrogen rates were in the same plot every year. So this is absolutely, you know, so you had a bad year, you had some really good years, you had most of them were in the middle. But the challenge is, <laughs> next year, if I have this ten, last 10 years of this, what nitrogen rate should I use in that field? I'm waiting until somebody tells me. Here's, I, I, we had four of these, and corn after corn and corn after soybean at each one, so we had eight. I'm only showing you four here. This is a much more uniform response location for corn after corn. And there I could pretty much make a pretty good guess that we probably need about 180. Here is corn following soybeans at our Urbana location. Again, a wide range of conditions. You can see that lower one there was kind of a straight line and never did get up to 140, 50 bushel. And this is at a fourth site, corn following soybean. That site's a little bit more prone to drought. So that's sort of the thing. And when you, when you average the 10 years together for each one of those, you see my now familiar curves that have a triangle that says, this is the best rate of nitrogen to use. And we just use, again, 375 corn, and I think uh, nitrogen at, at a price that a, a bushel of corn buys 10 pounds of nitrogen. That's normally sort of our default, and it works pretty well most of the time. So you've got the four locations, four lines up there with their triangles on them, and then you look at them and they don't look very different. So then you're sort of 
pondering a little bit. Uh, that lower one, PR, is Perry. It's got, that's the one that I said was drought, subject to drought, and it's got a little bit lower yield and nitrogen. And then I've got the average overall curve that's there, and it's right there in the middle. So you can kind of get a sense of where I'm heading with this. We're going to pretend that we really do know now, based on 10 years of data, what nitrogen that, that field should have next time we plant corn there. And we did that. So here's what we had. These are the four locations and then the average of all the data and then the average of the four locations, which are not the same. So you can see here, we, we can skip the N max and the N and Y max. That's the yield and nitrogen rate at the maximum yield. And then the optimum ones are here. And you can see for Perry, it was 161 producing 144 bushel down to DeKalb where it was 205 pounds of nitrogen and that produced 179 bushel under these conditions. And this is return to nitrogen done just the same way I told you we did uh, population. So those are the, this is now when we simulate a field and that's what we're doing here. So I call those, each location a soil type now out in a field. And you, you can see where we're headed. So at the optimum for all the fields, which is 177 pounds, this is what the yield and the return was. So if we had used the uniform rate over the whole field, that's what we would have used. And that's what our return would have been, uh, $312.19 return to nitrogen in that field. If we did them for the four blocks in this field, four zones, each with their exact nitrogen rate that they needed, the ones I just showed you, then we, you can see how different the nitrogen rates would be. We go from that 161 in one part of the field to 205 in another, and we'd end up with using an average of 179, two pounds more nitrogen, and getting one bushel more yield, and we would have returned $2.25 more per acre. So this is, a, you know, again, this is, you might look at that and say, well, that's not the real world. Well, how do you know in one of your fields how the nitrogen responses would actually vary over this year? You know, do we know how to set? Oops. Boy, this thing is on my case. I think it's ready to sing something now. Uh, It's Cortana, and it says, ask me anything, and... Okay, we're, I think we're back. Okay, so all that's left to do now is we're doing the corn after soybean one. As you saw, those were, you know, they don't need near as much nitrogen. And they were in the same fields, the same trial as the corn after corn ones I just showed you. So they're, the data are real, and you can see how much variability we have there. And this is by location then. You can see our optimum nitrogen rate varied from 113 to 150 over those locations, and the yields from 143 to 215 at the optimum. And this is our simulation of using these in a whole field then. And you can kind of see we ended up with very similar results. Your return to nitrogen is lower with corn fouling soybean because it doesn't produce as much yield increase. So we're take, calculating it as a return over zero nitrogen. And you can see here that we gained $2.04 if we put nitrogen exactly the amount that was needed in each part of this field. So our ongoing lack of ability to predict end rate for a zone or field before or early in the season is going to continue to be a problem for variable rate. Basing it on yield goal for a soil or zone is not reliable. Yield potential and soil end supply 
this is kind of a critical point. They're both related directly to organic matter, if that's the main variable across a field. The good, good conditions for corn growth are good conditions generally for mineralization of nitrogen from the soil. They tend to cancel each other out. And the honest reality, if you looked over everything, you would probably start to pick up that optimum end rates are higher where soil organic matter is lower and lower where soil organic matter is higher. And so the need for nitrogen might be the inverse of what we expect the yield potential to be. So I've often asked, but yes. If you've got a, let's just take a field and say in this corner of the field, the organic matter is, you know, three and a half percent, and in the rest of the field, it's, it's two and a half percent. Where that organic matter, unless there's a drainage problem there, that's where we would expect the yields to be higher, and we would also expect the supply of nitrogen from soil organic matter to be higher. So what it's telling us is those things tend to, the need tends to be met easier where the need is greater. And I've, I've often asked people, one person recently said, I'm doing variable rate nitrogen. I said, how are you doing it? He said, I'm increasing my nitrogen fertilizer rate where my organic matter is, the lower, is lower. And I suspect that's the proper way to do it. It goes against what people always have thought with nitrogen and a lot of other things is that higher yields need higher rates. And it's simply not true. If the soil is the main difference there, then I think we need to use common sense about there. And I just raised the question, might using, using lower end rates where soil organic matter is higher makes sense? And I think it does. Like variable rate seeding, the return to variable rate nitrogen may be modest. And we probably need to keep the cost low with this. I think I'm ready to, I'm about to call Tajikistan here. Uh, okay, I'm going to learn by the time I'm done here in about five minutes what I should be doing here. Um, so Another comment, you know, I didn't talk today much about variable canopy sensing and basing variable rates on color, uh, crop color and photographs and drone pictures and that kind of thing. But our ongoing lack of ability to predict end rate for a zone is going to continue to be a, a, a barrier. I move on to the next one. And just say that canopy sensing to decide has been a major effort, but deciding the right amount of deficiency, getting the right amount of deficiency to make uh, sensor-based or photograph-based application rates has not been very easy to do. We've had, what, eight or nine years now, probably, the onboard sensors that put real time, you know, they sense the canopy color and put more nitrogen on where there's uh, uh, lighter color. It's been really difficult to get these things to work satisfactorily, and that's because deficiencies don't occur, do not follow our commands very well. <laughs> Even if we could determine, you know, getting the right amount of deficiency to appear, I said, there is more a matter of luck than of skill. This last year with the conditions we had in May and June, our corn was this tall before zero nitrogen started to look deficient. And there's no way a side dress application would have picked up a difference. No way. Even if we can determine what a best rate is for part of a field, it looks like the return to doing this is going to be fairly small. And maybe we ought to just consider using normal rates and have rescue applications in reserve for times when this is needed. That's one way to do variable rate, but it's a costly way to be ready for problems when we don't know how often we're going to have them. That's a picture I took this last June. On the right, had had 200 pounds of nitrogen. On the left, there hadn't been any. What would a, what would a sensor see there? What would a drone see there? The answer is it wouldn't see anything 
that would help it put out the right rate of nitrogen. So can we evaluate variable rate technology? Impressive dashboards, drone images, high resolution, and hardware are not the measure of success. Current, form, u current uniform sound management and returns for management should be our control. That's what we need to compete against. It is possible to alternate variable rate and uniform strips in the field and to use the yield monitor to see if variable rate pays. I've put that challenge out a number of times. Nobody's ever taken me up on it. If you wanted to test, and part of it is once you buy into variable rate, why do you want to see whether it was a good decision or not? A lot easier to just <laughs> assume it was. Now, I'd want to do that. I wouldn't want to test it. What's the point of that? But I just hope today I've helped you to think about this a little bit. And honestly, you know, if it doesn't help make, you know, increase return to an input like nitrogen, then it's not going to help us make more profit. Positive return to variable rate. I said this at the beginning. Require yield increases and or input decreases need to exceed the cost. Benefits of it are closely tied to how variable fields are. In Illinois, most fields are not highly variable, or at least not predictably so. And that's a big factor in this. If I was marketing variable rate, I wouldn't start in central Illinois. Because most responses are unpredictable, variable rate should always be used without endangering profits when the weather is unusually good or unusually poor. And limited returns... Uh, means the hardware and software and advice cost should be kept to a minimum. There is cool stuff coming soon, and I just wanted to show you I, I'm up with a little uh, variable rate, variable tillage planters. How about that for this group? Uh, sensing soil conditions and residue in the seeding strip. Variable depth planting. We already have a little bit of that with uh, variable down pressure or down pressure sensing based on sense moisture or temperature, maybe. You know, there's very little we can't, won't be able to do with this. Once you can have driverless cars, you can pretty much have anything. Um, variable rate or pulsed in applications. <laughs> pulsed meaning, you know, why not pulse insecticide on our seed if we need it? Oh, I, we aren't supposed to use those anymore. But anyway, if you pulse that or even even starter fertilizer, what if you put variable rates of it in a field? We're going to have the physical capability to do these and others. All are going to have variable and mostly unknown payback going into it, depending on the soil characteristics and the weather.